Should you be buying or selling the S&P 500 during the month of September? I'm going to answer that question for you in just a second, and it has everything to do with seasonality. In addition to telling you about the seasonal trends, I am going to show you why seasonality works. And I'm going to help you get ready for the best two months of the year. Hint, they're October and November, not September. Let's take a look at some of the data and jump into this. By the way, I'm Chris Johnson from MoneyMorning.com. I'm a quantitative analyst. I look at numbers for a living. This is what the numbers say for the month of December. Looking at the last 20 years of S&P performance, monthly performance in the month of September is the worst out of the whole year. So 12 months out there, this is the worst. A lot of people think that it's October. That's not true. October is a volatile month, but it is not the worst performing month. That title belongs solely to the month of September. Over the last 20 years, September is the worst month. It averages 1% to the downside. The market is typically going up historically over the last 20 years, and this stands out like a sore thumb. So it tells you right away, you should beware of the month of September. The average loss, as I said, is one month. And in addition to those losses, you also see volatility for the month of September go through the roof. Now, what makes September seasonality work? If you haven't been watching CNBC and some of the other financial media, they've been talking a lot about how weak September is for stocks. Well, it boils down to a couple of things that you can put your finger on and explain right away. First of all, lack of headlines. Think about when we have earnings. The last month that we had earnings start was July. Stocks did very well in the month of July. Before that, you had earnings kick off in April, another rally, and then January. We know how this trend goes, but a lack of headlines gives investors nothing to look at to drive prices either higher or lower. Let's face it, headlines can drive prices lower as well, but the mood that investors have been in, especially in 2023, as they see this as a comeback year where the Fed is really starting to thread the needle on the possibility that we're not going to see a recession, everybody's been in a buying mood on headlines. They simply disappear in September. We're at the end of the earnings season. Nothing else is out there. Kroger's coming up later this week, but for the most part, all of that excitement is gone and investors love exciting headlines when they want to buy stocks. Second thing is that economic data drops off. When you look at the data that's being released, it doesn't matter where it's coming from, we see a little bit of a lull in September. So that again takes away some of that headline activity that investors normally use as a reason to buy stocks. That's number one. Number two is a result of number one. It's a lack of participation. When you look at the average daily volume of the S&P 500 shares, the spiders, it drops historically in September. When you look at the NASDAQ 100, those are the QQQ shares. Your big companies like Amazon, Google, that volume drops as well. So daily participation, the number of shares that are changing hand on a daily basis stops to, starts to drop down. This leaves what I call a volume vacuum. So in other words, when you have fewer people there in the market exchanging shares of stock, it tends to lead to a little bit of these air pockets that can allow prices to drop. It's an inefficiency in prices. And whenever we see that, it increases volatility. When investors see volatility increase, they normally feel like they have to sell. On that note, when you look at some of the volatility indicators out there, like the CBOE VIX, the volatility index, that's also called the fear index, you start to see it rising. That's because we have more chop on the day-to-day -day basis. More chop makes investors nervous. And again, you get that volume vacuum and the price efficiency drops you get a little more volatility and things tend to run lower. The third is the most important. It's investor psychology. When we look at the behavior of investors, seasonality is one of the big, big things that's affected by psychology. Whether or not we believe it, when we look at September and you hear on some of the financial media that this is the worst worst month of the year. It's in the back of your head that all you need to do is start seeing a little bit of that performance drop off, like the S&P 500 being down 1% in the first week. And then all of a sudden investors say, hey, you know what? 
I'm going to get out of the way of September and they start to sell. And this turns into a self-fulfilling sell-off. That's what I refer to it as. The other thing that is key to remember when you're looking at psychology is where the market has been for the last couple of months. I already mentioned July earnings season. We saw stock prices continue to move higher. Guess what that did? You can look at the CNN fear and greed index. You can look at a number of different things, but that got investors into an optimistic mood. They were out there buying whatever stocks they could. And of course, artificial intelligence or AI is one of those things that also has investors chasing stocks higher. Whenever we get to those points, when optimism or greed is running the market, you're set up for a market top, or at least an intermediate market top. Last reading we had from that CNN fear and greed index was that we were in that greed territory. So investors are on a high right now. And as soon as we start to see a little bit of a shakeup in the market, that's when they decide it's time to step out, take some of my profits. And again, that feeds those lower price movements. Now, I've described what, which is that 1% move that we see in September to the downside in the S&P 500. And remember, that's an average. You've got some in there that are 8% to the downside, 10% to the downside, and you've obviously got some pluses. But you need to know that right now, this is the worst month of the year to be a bull on the S&P 500. Let's try to lower the microscope, though, and look at it on a week to week basis. This is where things get really, really interesting. I've got this uh, calendar and it's from Tom Gentile. If it is his money calendar, it actually identifies every day of the, the uh, month of September and where we see concentrations of historical patterns that lead stocks lower. And you're going to notice right off the bat here that this week, the week that starts on September 18th, has the majority of those red and orange days. That identifies a broader weakness in the market. So in other words, historically, when you look at the patterns over the last 10 years, you see more stocks moving lower during that week of the month of September. Now, this is really interesting because guess what is gonna happen right in here? That's September 20th. The Fed is going to have a two-day meeting that starts on the 19th, and they're going to announce their interest rate decision on the 20th. You're going to have a lot of volatility that starts to lead up to that market. And as we've seen over the last six months, 12 months, a lot of volatility on the other side. Investors right now have expectations expectations are part of that psychology. They've got expectations that the Fed is not going to increase interest rates. Right now, if the Fed comes out and decides to go up one more quarter point, that's going to act out as another catalyst to bring stock prices lower, increase volatility. So this is the week. If you're looking at the market right now as one that you really want to avoid, September 18th through the 22nd is that week that I would just sit in cash if you're that nimble of a trader. Now, the other side of this is right here. That last week of September, guess what it leads into? And I'm going to go back to that calendar that we already saw or that picture that we already saw of the monthly performance. But that leads to a situation where you have got two of the best months of the year in October and November. They return 1.9% to the upside in October and 2% or 2.2% in November. This is that comeback rally that we're used to seeing that charges us up into the end of the year and most investors always want to be in this. Here's the key for you. As the S&P starts to bottom out because of that volatility in September, you're usually going to see it shake out with a little bit lower prices in October. Why do we think that October is the worst? Because if you ask people on the street what the worst month of the year is, they're going to tell you October. That goes right back to that psychology. How many of those days that we've called Black Monday or Black Friday fall in October? Normally, that's that crescendo of fear. You've heard the saying before, you buy when there's blood in the street. Well, those kind of days usually happen in October. And when they happen, it is the best opportunity to be buying everything that you can with both hands, because typically that is going to slingshot you higher. So 
How do I prepare for this? Well, as we rolled into September, I started protecting my portfolio using put options. I'm using put options on the S&P 500 because that's where the seasonality tells me the weakness is going to happen. And I've been using it on the small cap Russell 2000 as well, because you know what? Small cap stocks tend to see exaggerated moves to the downside. When I look at the NASDAQ 100 right now, trying to stay away from shorting that or buying puts on that, because remember, that Magnificent 7, those groups of stocks like NVIDIA and Microsoft, they make up that NASDAQ 100 and they are the ones that everybody's going to be looking to buy. So for now, I've been looking at the IWM, which is the Russell 2000, and the S&P 500. At a sector level, I'm actually looking at the regional banks as another one of those areas of the market that's going to go lower. Remember, just weeks ago, we've seen downgrades or warning of downgrades from some of the bond rating agencies. So there is risk right now out there in the landscape for those companies, and they're going to have some downside or magnified downside potential. What I'm also doing, and you're hearing me say that I'm protecting my portfolio. The other side of this is I am putting my watch list together. Those stocks that I want to buy as the market pulls back 5, 10% or so, I am putting them down on a piece of paper and putting prices next to them that I want to buy them at. It allows me to do one thing, and that is think clearly when the market is frantic. When we see those market bottoms, typically everybody sits around and asks all kinds of questions like, is this the bottom? Is this stock going to go even lower? Get that out of your head, set your price that you want to buy stocks at before we start to see that turmoil take over in the market. So there you have it. September indeed is not a month to be bullish on the S&P 500. I'm expecting somewhere around a 5 to 10% pullback that is going to be focused on that third week of the month where we'll likely to see the most volatility in the market. Remember, September's swoon here, or that move lower, which has been backed by 20 years of historical data, also leads to a fully, a, a let's call it a profitable October and November that you don't want to miss. That's how I'm positioning myself on this bearish seasonality month of September for the S&P 500. Remember to like and follow to get more information like this, trading ideas, data on trends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm Chris Johnson from Morning Morning. As always, wishing you the best trading success. Have a great day, folks.